Like, what, what is, we are the wealthiest country on the planet. How many, what is the status of hunger among kids today in America? Well, as wealthy as we are, as you know, we've still got a lot of poverty, and hum- hunger is yeah. really a symptom of poverty. I'm, so, you know, with, with uh, close to— It's a stunning amount of uh, poverty in this it's, level. It's huh? stunning, and what's, what's really stunning is that poor people haven't recovered the way the rest of the economy has. So in, in 2006, Bill, we had 26 million Americans on the food stamp program. We call it SNAP now. Mm-hmm. Uh, last year, that number was 46 million. Now it's down to about 43 million, but everything else has recovered. Autos have recovered, insurance has recovered, banks have recovered, but poor people haven't. We've still got 43 million on food stamps. Half of them are children. And Secretary Vilsack of the USDA that oversees these programs, he'll tell you that one of, of all the kids in America today, one out of two will be on food assistance at some point in their lifetime. This is really this is uncharted ter- this is uncharted territory for our country. I mean, this is All really shocking. in America, right. one out of two will be in food assistance at some point in, right. in their lifetime. Um, and so, you know, the the terrible thing, of course, is that kids in this country aren't hungry for the same reasons that kids around the rest of the world. It's not war or, or drought or famine. Uh, it's poverty and our lack of ability to connect them to anti-poverty programs. But when it comes to kids in particular, we, as you say, we've made a lot of progress in that regard. Well, before we get to just I want to ask you about this food stamp because th- this number of people on food stamps, because I hear all the time, and we hear all the time from uh, Newt Gingrich, who's famous for sure. this, uh, among others, right, saying, this proves that the Obama, Obama economy is a failure. We have more people on food stamps in this country than ever before. What does it mean that so many people are on food stamps? Well, I think what it means, and, and you even saw this during uh, Clinton's presidency, during kind of the you know the boom years, is there's a there's a probably a, a, a sector of our economy, probably the bottom quintile uh, in terms of income or economics, who don't get pulled along when the economy does better. They're kind of they've been stuck, and we have an economy that just doesn't reach everybody. I think that's been the biggest problem. It's income in e- the income inequality. It's income inequality, right? which has gotten worse. Which is which has gotten worse. Yep. And so as as things have improved for the top one percent, right, or two percent, or even maybe the top ten percent, but this these bottom, there's nothing is trickling down. No, that's right. And th- th- I mean that's just a remarkable number uh, in this day and age of people who need food assistance. Right. You say there's not as not as many kids going hungry every night today as there were eight years ago. So what progress yeah. have we made under President Obama, and and how? Well, here's the thing. One one of the things at Share Strength that we started to really focus on with the No Kid Hungry campaign is why are there so many kids hungry? We've got all these great public programs like not just food stamps, but school meals, school lunch, school breakfast, yeah, so forth. A lot of great private organizations, whether it's Feeding America or Share Our Strength. Uh, bread for the world, what have you. So we started to ask ourselves, why is this the case? And we realized there was this incredible opportunity because many millions of kids were just not participating in programs that had set up, been set up for them. Mm, so mm-hmm. if you take the school lunch program, we've got 21 million kids who get lunch. All 21 million are eligible for breakfast. When we started focusing on this, 9 million were getting it. So you think, why is that? Well, at yeah. lunch, they're already there. Breakfast, you have to get there yeah. early. There's yeah. the stigma yeah. attached to being the kids who go early. But the crazy thing is, bought and paid for, for all 21 million. An entitlement program so small that Democrats and Republicans exempted it from sequestration. Oh. You know, one of the few oh. things that's yeah. not wow. going to go away huh. for kids yeah. Uh, yeah. in a world where a lot is at risk of going away. And so we started going around to governors around the country saying, do you realize, and this, this was the argument that really worked, Do you realize, I just had this conversation with Jerry Brown about uh, six weeks ago, do you realize you've left $160 million in Washington? In California's case, it's a lot more. Uh, In California's case, it was several hundred million. In Washington, that could only be used to buy milk from your dairy farms and bread from your bakers to feed your kids in school. And every governor, Democrat or Republican, liberal conservative says, what do I have to do to to, yeah, to get that money. Yeah. Um, and, and so, it, it and we help them enroll these kids. It can only be in. used for that program, correct? Yeah, exactly. You know, it's yeah. an entitlement program. Otherwise, it just sits in some account. Um, so it's a big opportunity. And so we've enrolled, we've literally added 3 million kids to school breakfast over the last couple of years. We've built uh, tens of thousands, close to 100,000 summer meal sites. It's the same deal in the summertime when the mm. schools are closed. Um, and, and, and the improving economy has reached some of these families. So Secretary Vilsack, who I was with the other day, told us that the number of kids in the country who are hungry on a chronic basis now is at the lowest level since they've been recording. Um, so that's that's significant progress. But the fact that that much issue. money is out there that's just being it's stunning missed. It is. Yeah, 
is is shocking. It's staggering, and that's why I think it's so important that you're doing what you're doing. But it's also a little depressing that these that these guys are missing well, it. It's really depressing because I made it sound like a logistical issue. It's really a political issue. So the first governor I talked to was Governor Ritter of Colorado, and when he said, "You know, how can this possibly be true?" I said, you know, if it had been a defense contract earmarked oh. Oh, for, yeah. for, you know, yeah. and defense contracts right. are earmarked, their subcontracts are earmarked yeah. for different states. I said, somebody would have been in the governor's office a long time ago. So it's really a testament to the fact that these kids are, they're not just vulnerable, they're voiceless, right? I mean, kids don't vote, they don't have PACs, they don't, uh, you know, they don't have lobbyists. And people think in a, you know, civic sense that uh, people yeah. are probably in the governor's office talking about what's good for kids. That's not, that's not what governors talk about. Yeah. Well, they've got you, though. They've so, got you. Oh, well, they've hopefully. got No Kids Hungry. They've got Share Our Strength. What happens to these programs under a President Donald Trump? Well, that's, a, that's, that's the big question. I think um, the good news is that so many of these programs are executed at the state level that I think our work and the progress continues. The bigger question will be whether Trump and Speaker Paul Ryan and others try to do things like block grant, um, the SNAP program, in which case it'll go away in a lot of states, whether they try and actually cut funding for some of these programs that have been these protected entitlement programs, that's an unknown. I think he's got you know some bigger things on his agenda. We may not even be on his radar screen for a little while. Yeah, but you could be on Paul Ryan's radar could screen. could be on Paul Ryan's. Because he wants to block grant uh, everything just right. about. All right, now you've got this podcast, right, yeah. on this issue. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, tell us about that. So, uh, well, it's really been fascinating. It's called Add Passion and Stir. It's on iTunes, like your podcast mm-hmm. and so many others. Add, and Add, add passion, passion and, and stir. stir. Love the name. Yeah, and the reason, thank you. Yeah. The reason we call it that is because every episode consists of talking to somebody in the food world, usually a chef or a restaurateur, uh, and somebody in kind of the social change world. And the reason we set it up that way is, and people I think have become in- increasingly sensitive to this. Food is so connected to so many things in our lives. It's connected to our health. It's connected to um, uh, education, kids' ability to learn. Mm-hmm. Right? Community. I mean, it's connected yeah. to community. meeting people. Yeah, no, absolutely. And people are starting to realize that. And many chefs who you know got into the business because they love to cook and they love to build community have started to realize that you know food can actually change lives. We did a podcast episode yesterday with a, a woman named Sarah Pollan who has uh, two restaurants in D.C. They're soup. They're uh, soup. Uh, shops really and uh, her brand is Supergirl uh, and she says she's changing the world one bowl of soup at a time because all of her ingredients are organic it's all vegan she feels like she's changing the carbon footprint she's changing Mm. people's health so there is this increased sensitivity and so on these episodes of Add Passion and Stir we always have somebody who's passionate about food and somebody who's passionate about social change and we find kind of the common bonds between the two of them and they're connected to the kids program as well um, well, many of them are connected to uh, our No Kid Hungry campaign, but many yeah. of them are just involved in the community in their own way. Uh, and, you know, chefs and restaurateurs get asked to, you know, they're kind of anchors in their community. They get asked to do everything. Some yeah. of them are working with the, you know, the, the Save the Whales or the Kidney Foundation right. or the zoo. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Some of them are working yeah. with Share Our Strength. No, one, really, of the more, one of the more interesting really episodes are. I saw, there was one where you talk about how it factors into gang violence. Right. You know, and again, it's like food and restaurants and chefs are sort of these pillars of of the community and people sort of gather around them for not only food and sustenance but ideas and things like that so right. I, I think it's really fascinating we had joe marshall on from uh, from the oakland from the bay area who does oh, yeah. gang yeah. Uh, you know uh-huh. and violence prevention with a chef uh, from uh, brown sugar kitchen in oakland named tanya <laughs> holland african-american soul food kind of chef and they were talking about you know how you kind of create community through food and, and reaching kids this is fascinating but you know chefs really have become and they've become celebrities they've become, exactly yeah yeah and wasn't always that way right no, that's there right. are more and more who are celebrities and you're and and, and I, I thought of it that way but not just because of their cuisine talents right but or culinary talents or whatever but because of their role in the community yeah. and and you're right they are identified more and more with different causes uh, and um, and this is this is bringing it all together here. I love that. Add passion and stir. Big chefs, big ideas. 